watching The Paul Stefan Show on TV Free Baltimore. Hello, this is Paul Stefan, and welcome to today's edition of The Paul Stefan Show. And I'm honored today to have as our guest Kathleen M. Berry, who is the Executive Director of the Historical Society of Baltimore County. So, welcome, Kathleen. Thank you very much. Very now, glad to be here. I want to talk about a little bit about, you know, where you are, which is, of course, the Historical Society. Uh, what is your role there, or what do you do as far as the programming and the uh, facilities there? Well, um, as you mentioned, I'm the executive director, and um, I'm actually the only employee. We're blessed to have a very large volunteer corps that really makes the place run. We have about 35 volunteers, and they're mm -hmm. really the ones who are in there doing the work all the time. We also have mm -hmm. a board of uh, 17 who uh, are volunteering as well as mm -hmm. our board of directors. Um, so I'm kind of in the middle of those two groups, and, okay. <laughs> um, working with the board to figure out what we should be doing and working with the volunteers who are... Uh, busy running our programs, um, handling our collections. We have quite an extensive, um, we have extensive historical collections of photographs, museum artifacts, documents, uh, all of which total, let's see, we have 37,000 items in the catalog, and wow. we're still cataloging. So wow. the, the ultimate total, we don't know what it'll be, but we, we know we have thousands more. And books. In books, of course. There's yes. a library. Yes, we have a research library, exactly. So people can come in and do research, mm -hmm. um, which is one of our main services to the public. If you want to come in and research uh, genealogy, that's probably our biggest draw. We get mm -hmm. a lot of people in to do their family history. If you want to research a historic property in the county, we have um, quite a lot of records pertaining to, to properties, and we have uh, about a 1,000 maps and atlases, so we can mm -hmm. find things on old maps for you, and, mm -hmm. um, and just lots of other topic areas, too. So... We have quite a lot on the water system, for example. Oh. So if people want to um, know more about this mysterious lost town of Warren, which some people have heard of, which uh, was a mill town that got flooded out for the Lock Raven Reservoir when it was expanded in 1921, or learn about the building of Pretty Boy Dam, something like that. We have lots of materials on things like that. Okay, and there's also a museum, isn't there? Sort of a museum? Sort of. We have a museum <laughs> collection. Um, for various reasons, we... Um, we're squeezed into half of the the historic building that we're in, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, mm -hmm. So at the moment, we our renovation. I'm sorry, our museum space is closed for renovations, but we're hoping uh. within about six months, hopefully, to to get some museum space open to get some of our. Okay. Uh, the treasures from our collections out so people can see them. We do have a, a barn museum, oh, yeah. which is, um, it's it's a barn, as, <laughs> as it sounds like, <laughs> full of uh, all sorts of historic bar um, farming implements and old coaches and plows, and there's a whole carpentry shop in there and a lot of old mm -hmm. photographs. So there's a lot of interesting mm -hmm. things, but we do need a little more renovation there to open that <laughs> to the public. And we're working on a museum room inside the Alms House, which is the huh. historic building we're in, where we'll have a little exhibit on the Alms House itself and hopefully rotating exhibits so we can show off some of the textiles we have. We have a wonderful textile collection, quilts and clothing mm -hmm. dating back in, in a few cases to the late 1700s, but wow. mostly uh, 1800s and 1900s and um, you know silver and old mm. daguerreotypes and you know old photographs and just all sorts of wonderful treasures so we're we are keen to get them back on display as best we terrific, can. Terrific, terrific. I mean as you mentioned it and I've been there and the building is still is beautiful I think that gray stone and uh, it was the Baltimore County Alms House and you may want to explain to people what that building was or what its function used to be. Yes, I'd love to explain that. It was um, it was built in the early 1870s, opened in 1874, and it was basically the poorhouse. So it was a, a county-provided place for people who um, either you know, people who needed a, a place to go, whose family could not take care of them if they were ill, or um, uh, many of the, the inmates, as they were called, <laughs> many of the residents uh, suffered from mental illness. Some were just physically ill, um, and some were just indigent and had nowhere else to go. So the county provided this space for them to come live. Um, you know, not, not necessarily palatial, <laughs> but it was a place for people to go, kind of a proto, um, retirement home slash nursing home slash homeless shelter and other things all rolled in together that weren't didn't exist as we know them now back then. Did they run so, programs for these people? Because one of the things that came in my mind is something like a settlement house. but uh, Not that we're aware of. Um, okay. 
Mm, they were living it, kind of Spartan existence. Okay, so they didn't um, teach because like, you know this was skills county charity. or crafts like make, well, broom making or basket weaving or anything. No. Well, they did want um, the residents to work as much as they could to kind of okay. support themselves as best they could. So it was a working farm. So at farm. one point, I think it was up to 270 acres. Wow. So it was a, quite a substantial farm. So whoever could, whoever was able-bodied enough, would work on the farm. Um, some of the other residents, especially the women, may have had jobs, um, kind of inside jobs, laundry, mm-hmm. kitchen, helping in the kitchen. Um, a few would help the superintendent's family. The superintendent was, of course, the person, uh, the man who ran the place, mm-hmm. and he and his family would live there. And um, and they, if they had children, one of the residents might help watch the children because the superintendent's wife had a lot mm-hmm. of responsibilities okay. as well, making sure everybody got fed and kept, you know, mm-hmm. maintained clothing and bedding for everybody and all of that. So. Well, what surprised me was reading the plaque out front that there were people still living there into the late 1950s. And that's amazing. You think that is the yeah. mo- modern age and people were still there at this almshouse. Yes. Well, you do see, um, as you get towards the beginning of the 20th century, people start to pay more attention to mental illness. So you start to get more specialized facilities. And of course, you get um, more specialized facilities for the elderly. So eventually, the need for an almshouse is really falling away over time into the 20th century. But it's still there, um, you know, essentially as a homeless shelter, probably more than anything else. But um, it did remain open until 1958. And wow. um, we have a memorial corner in, in the Alms House now in our, our offices for the Historical Society for Isabella Perkins, who was the last inmate mm. to leave the Alms House. And she worked for the, the superintendent doing various things. So we have a little memorial space for her. Now, just curious because of my love of history, are there anybody who was actually there as a resident that's either you you or people there over time have interviewed or might still be alive? Um, we don't know of anybody who lived there. Um, we do have records going back. They did a census every year, so that's one of the best things we have. Mm-hmm. We have these ledgers telling you who, who was there each year. Mm-hmm with information about where they came from, of course their mm-hmm. race and gender is noted, um, why they came. So um, that's always interesting to look at because of course the nomenclature from the late 19th century is a little different. So we have yes. people marked as destitute, <laughs> um, dropsy is mentioned, which is buildup of fluid. I had to look that one up. It's like, what is dropsy anyway? <laughs> not a term we use anymore. And, no, exactly. And you know, a lot of things not very politically incorrect. Yeah. Um, because describing I mean, if they were people's. very young or children, they would be 60s, 70s today if they were there in the 1950s. So it's still possible you have somebody who could tell you about, you know, what it was like, and at least it's towards the end, or the oral history of uh, the almshouse. Yes, I, I don't believe we've had that luck. We do know, um, Grant, we, we do personally know, some of us at the Elms House, uh, some of the grandchildren of the last superintendent. So ah. they do have memories of being there. And, oh. and the superintendent, um, Mr. William Chilcote, did stay on after the Elms House, oh. as such, was closed. He stayed on as superintendent for the building, which became Great. other county offices. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, some of his grandchildren are in touch with us and mm-hmm. have memberships, and so mm-hmm. we do know some folks. But That's good. Now, is that other building that's like further down? Was that the like the administrator's home or something? Is it, is it, you go yeah. down that way and you see this other little stone house. Was that like the superintendent's home? Well, that is an interesting building. It's known <laughs> as the Pest House, and oh, Pest, it was. <laughs> yes, Pest is short for pestilence. So it was built at the same time the main um, the main building was built. And basically its purpose was for quarantine. So if, if um, residents at the Alms House had some kind of communicable disease, they had a place to kind of put them away from the general population and try and contain the disease. Mm-hmm. Um, interestingly, though, we don't have great records on this, but we do have suggestions and old news clippings and things that actually most of the time it was used for racial segregation. Ooh. So there were a few outbreaks of diseases where they did use it for quarantine, but we think mostly what they did, because in the almshouse itself, the, the floors were segregated by gender and race, mm-hmm. and African-American men, we believe, were generally housed down the hill in the pest house. Now, are there plans to open that to the public, that home? Well, um, at building? the moment, it's a kind of on hold. Um, a few years back, a gentleman named Louis Diggs, who you may have heard oh, of. Oh, yes, I know yeah, him. He's, I'll him very well. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mr. Diggs, of course, is the leading authority on African-American history in the yes, county. Yes, And um, has done many wonderful projects over the years. And he was planning on taking on the Pest House and wanted to turn it into an African-American research center. Mm-hmm. Which and we were helping him with that. Um, unfortunately, as and he had lined up some grants to be able mm. to do it as well. Unfortunately, it didn't um, 
it, they had some sticking points in, in working on exactly how it would work to get the, the facility open. So um, I think he kind of needed to walk away and take a break. And mm. um, I think maybe at this point he's done so many other things, I'm not <laughs> sure he wants to go back for more on that one. Because well, it's, it's quite a project. Unfortunately, the pest house is in pretty rough shape inside. The, mm. Some of the floors are rotted away. Mm. Um, so it's an awful lot of work to get it renovated yeah, to, to be usable. And it's not a very large space either. So it's a little challenging. Well, another thing for, I guess, the average person who may be interested in history you need to speak about is your speakers series. Ah, yes. Well, that's, <laughs> we have many public programs, but the speaker series is a... Um, is uh, one of our more popular ones. We have a, a talk at basically every month, um, hopefully throughout the year in the future. We've been doing them up through September. But um, we have a wonderful array, uh, array of topics. So coming up, um, starting in January, we're going to have a talk on the lost town of Warren that I mentioned. Oh, there you go. By one of our volunteers who's done <laughs> lots of research on it. And then we're going to have a talk on the history of um, traffic signals. Oh. There's actually a local gentleman, and he, he came and talked before, and, and people found it quite fascinating. He's amassed his own personal collection of historic traffic control devices. So, you know, we think of stoplights, but lots of other things as well. Mm -hmm. So he's going to come talk on that. I thought the inventor actually was from Maryland of the electronic traffic light, I um, think. That could well be. I know there <laughs> was a gentleman who... Um, created a switching device for the Ma and Pa Railroad locally that went on to design very important uh, airplane lighting as well, or air control. And there was an African-American who had something to do with switches to, uh, the switch of traffic, I think, or something with the railroads, or for cars, too, I believe. He doesn't get enough credit. No, uh, surely not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and you say you have other public programs. So why don't you mention those? Mm. Well, um, actually, in just uh, next weekend, we have our annual bus tour. We have a, a volunteer committee that puts together a spectacular day-long bus tour. They do a wonderful job organizing it. So they've gone to Catonsville in the past, and they did a wonderful tour called From Falls to Fawcett, going into different parts of the water system. Mm. Uh, this year they are going out to Carroll County, which ah. used to be part of Baltimore County. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they will be going to the Farm Museum and then touring um, some of the charming old parts of Westminster. And it includes lunch and all the the bus tour it's you know the bus transportation this year is a little more walking than it often is but um mm -hmm. anyway they they put together a wonderful tour good and uh we have occasional lectures outside of our speaker series um every year we do a joint program with the baltimore city historical oh, society okay. so this year um they're hosting and we mm -hmm. are doing a police history ah. uh, theme so we've got four speakers lined up the former um the fairly recently retired um, baltimore county police chief um, and a retired detective from Baltimore City who's become mm -hmm. a kind of historian of the Baltimore City Police, oh, um, an academic from Morgan State who's quite knowledgeable about policing. So it should be a great program. It sounds, sounds like it would be. Yeah. And that's Especially November for me again. and that uh, my grandfather and my uncle were both in the Baltimore City Police Force. <laughs> and as far as this town of Warren, if I have this correct, I've done a lot of research on a family, and they were, I think, part owners of what was there, of the mills. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah, because our famous house, if you're not aware of it already, the uh, the English Council Mansion, are you aware of that? I've heard of it, yes. Home? You should see it. It's not on, I, I think it's on the County Historical Register, but it should be on the National Historical Register because it's probably one of the oldest houses and probably the only one in Baltimore County that's not, you know, considered a historical site mm -hmm. because it's still a residence. But I'm sure parts of it go back to the 18th century. And uh, for this part, where we are now in southwestern mm -hmm. Baltimore County, there was hardly anything out here. So it's a great story there, and I won't bore you or the audience <laughs> with that right now. But <laughs> with all those programs, part of it, too, is like, how do we make this relevant history today for people today? Um, you said you could help students with their projects. Um, sure. Well, I am a huge fan of the History Day program, okay. National History Day, mm -hmm. which has a, a local level and a state level and a national level. And I've been judging that for a while, which I, I absolutely love. Interesting. To I have to share that with my daughter because she has judged the last two years. Oh, has she? <laughs> yes. It's, it's just, it's fantastic. I feel I'm always proselytizing for judging, but I mean, you, you just be amazed at how, what wonderful work these kids do. Mm -hmm. It really makes you feel great about, <laughs> you know, the Right. the future of history, so to speak. Terrific. <laughs> Speaking of that, I would say um, that, you know, with our today, what I like to call ephemeral digital age, mm -hmm. what kind of problems do you foresee 
for future historians in capturing the history of today? Hmm. Well, that's a big question. Um, that's an interesting one, too. It's, it's hard to imagine what 50 years from now it's going to look like because we, you know, we, we uh, communicate by text, we communicate by email, and none of that is necessarily recorded in the way that, you know, documents that if you do historical exactly. research now, looking back, you have typewritten documents, you have yes. handwritten documents. Right. And, um, Books. And, Yes, I mean, <laughs> to my chagrin, my son isn't even really learning cursive handwriting in school right now. <laughs> it's like, what if he wants to be a historian? He can't. He won't be able to read anything. Right. But um, yes, it's uh, you know, I I think at the national level, the National Archives and you know, well, Library of Congress is supposed worrying, to, Library of Congress supposed this. to be archiving, I thought, tweets or something. Yes. So, but it's it's certainly a big concern that everybody should be thinking about. What history will look like by the time you're retired? Yeah, It'll exactly. Be interesting to see. Exactly. And um, part of that is like as uh, to get a plug in again for us is that you know local history. We decided, of course, a couple years back to capture that digitally mm -hmm. by doing you know HD quality video and also having a website with hundreds of photographs on it about our local. Lansdowne history. And as we spoke in June, we want to encourage every community to capture their local history that way because we at least think that's one way to capture a 21st century audience and get them interested in history because they're a visual generation. Absolutely. And uh, so, you know, that's one thing. And I would hope that, you know, that's something that, you know, you would also, you know, advocate that. Um, um, but uh, do you have in your collections uh, things like uh, about local sports, for example? Any sports stuff? Baltimore County sports, we'll say, since it can't be the city. <laughs> I'm sure we do. It's not or my the railroads, suit. <laughs> Or the railroads? Oh, or? my goodness. We have lots on the railroads. You do? Yes, we certainly do. And um, actually, speaking of our public programs, in August, um, I think our record-breaking attendance for a one of our Sunday speaker events was for the Mom Pa Railroad. We had mm -hmm. Rudy Fisher, who many mm -hmm. folks may know the name of the uh, Mom Pa Historical Society, come out. And it was just a blockbuster. We ended up turning a lot of people away and packed the room. So actually, he's very kindly agreed to come wow. back in November to give so, a very so similar talk. Speaker so yes. Will be this gentleman. <laughs> yes, Rudy Fisher. <laughs> what Sunday um, is that? That's November 12th okay. from 2 to 4. That's a Sunday, and okay, that'll good. be at the Alms House in Cockeysville. So he'll be Terrific. basically taking us on a uh, virtual ride with slides on okay. Mon Pa through Baltimore County and a little bit into Harford County as well. All the way up to York, Pennsylvania was the terminus. Yes. Okay. Yes, so the, the mom paw is fascinating. I can see I didn't know much about it until um, <laughs> Mr. Fisher came to speak, and we ended up doing, we, we have a, oh, something else I should mention, we have publications, and we do a, ah, yes. a quarterly um, local history journal called okay. History Trails, and our okay. most recent History Trails is about the mom paw. Oh, there There's you a go. A little synergy there with the talks and the mom paw. <laughs> but it really is, I mean, it's a, it's a very quaint, I can see the charm for people. Mm -hmm. It was this railroad that instead of going from here to there, went here and <laughs> all through this lovely rural land landscape and right. you Terrific. know picked up milk from dairy farmers and delivered milk around and served as a hearse essentially for the the nuns at Villa Assumpta and oh, okay. you know, served all these interesting <laughs> a lot of different functions. things then. yes so I think people will enjoy that talk so I yes. hope they do go yes now then how did you get interested in history and how young were you goodness um I think high school was really um the seminal moment for me I had a wonderful um history teacher in high school and took I think two classes with him the standard AP American history and then I think an additional elective the following year anyway just a wonderful teacher and and really got me hooked on history and so when I went to college I think I flirted briefly with art history but figured out pretty quickly that wasn't quite the right thing for me <laughs> so I I majored in history in college took a lot more especially American history than I needed to <laughs> to fulfill the major and then left college I, I wrote a dis um, sorry a uh, uh, a, a, a thesis, a, you know, yeah. an undergraduate thesis. And we should say to everybody, um, this was at Harvard University. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a senior thesis, rather. Sorry. Um, and that really, I, I loved doing that, the, the research and the writing. I mean, you know, it was challenging, but it was a great challenge. So what was the I left. topic? Do you remember? Yes. Uh, I'm from Buffalo, New York, originally, mm -hmm. and I decided to, to stay local to that. So it was about the civil rights movement in Buffalo, New York. Oh, interesting. 
and the and the student left as well and how the the two interacted and it was kind of interesting because the 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 civil rights movement and the student left were both very active and had mm-hmm. drew a lot of power from each other. But then eventually we have this kind of general narrative of them, you know, as they get more and more radical towards the end of the decade, things start to fall apart and mm-hmm. community and students don't necessarily work together as well. But actually in Buffalo, things were a lot more cooperative for a lot longer with the um, mm-hmm. African-American community and kind of the grassroots civil rights community working with the student left. and. And being a little, there's not quite that narrative of things kind of heading south because of mm-hmm. radicalization and um, persecution by the federal government and all the things that okay. historians talk about in that era. Is that where you got the interest in labor history? I think so, but only a little bit. That really blossomed much more in um, graduate school. What the, so at I, NYU? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. When I graduated from college, I decided to take a couple years to go work and just do something entirely different, but was pretty sure I wanted to go back to, to get a graduate degree in history. And I worked for an investment manager, and that was fine, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. So I <laughs> okay. did that for a little while and then said, I'm going back to grad school. <laughs> That's planned. And grad, graduate school is really where I picked up um, a much stronger interest in women's history and labor history. So staying within 20th century U.S. was always kind of my area of interest, but those subfields became much more important to me. So those are considered to be your fields or your areas of speciality. Yeah. Women's history so. and labor history. Mm-hmm. And then something came along, and tell me a little bit about this, which is, you know, the, uh, the, the Mellon Research Fellowship in American History. And uh, how did you get that? And, uh, and I know from there you went to Cambridge University, Jesus yes. College. Yes. So speak a little bit about that, please. Well, that was a, a great stroke of luck. Um, after I finished my PhD, um, I had written this dissertation about um, female flight attendants, which I thought was a, a topic that would have some, some interest for for folks, uh, mostly academics, but maybe some people outside of academia. So I really left graduate school hoping I might be able to turn that into a book. And I went to work for a a history nonprofit in New York City and actually had a wonderful job there. I enjoyed very much, but was thinking, uh, if I'm working full time, I'm never going to get this book done. (laughs) So I applied for a few postdoctoral fellowships and hit the jackpot Mm -hmm. (laughs) with the fellowship at Cambridge. And just uh, on a more personal note, was extremely lucky. At that point, I um, was recently married and my... Um, husband was offered a transfer at his employer to the London office literally oh. th- within about 24 hours of when I heard I had the Cambridge Fellowship. Wow. So we said, of course, we're going to go live in England. Why, <laughs> why wouldn't we? <laughs> talk about luck, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, the thing to talk about, because I, I don't know if it was maybe when you were a graduate student or not, but it said you taught, I guess, at NYU, mm-hmm. but then also here you are teaching at Jesus College. Mm-hmm. So the here, the, for, again, for viewers, and sometimes people have seen this on television, but it's just fictional stuff, the differences between teaching methods or the teaching styles or what's expected in America as opposed to England? Hmm. Well, um, the teaching I did at NYU would generally reflect a kind of American um, college college history courses where typically you have, uh, occasionally you get a small scale seminar, but usually you'll have a class with enough students where there will be a couple lectures you go to and then they'll have um, a professor or maybe a graduate student will teach a discussion section separately. So you'll go for an hour where you're supposed to have done the reading and be able to talk about the reading and whatnot. Right. And then you go take your exam and then you're done with the course <laughs> and maybe write a few papers. Um, the system at Cambridge is quite different. And to be honest, Cambridge and Oxford have a very distinctive system within the English framework. So I'm not I can't really speak to what goes on at other universities. All English right, well, talk about what happens at Cambridge. Yes, yeah, so well, Cambridge and Oxford <laughs> do what they call the tutorial system. So basically, students have one on one meetings. Occasionally, they'll pack in a few. <laughs> so you might have a couple. But the idea is that you're supposed to have a one on one meeting each week with a professor. And the professor will give that student quite a bit of reading to do and ask them to do some writing. And you sit down for an hour and talk about that. They also have some lectures that'll be on the side. But um, basically, it's this much more intensive kind of talking and, and writing. So the students develop great skills, generally, in being able to um, really speak about history very articulately. So it's, it's got a real strength there. It's a different system also, though, in that um, English undergraduate degrees you do in three years, but y- you only do coursework in the area you chose as your major. You don't mm. do anything else. So if you're a history student, you take three years of history classes, and that is it. Mm. And they don't really grade the classes. You take exams that 
that's your grade. <laughs> you take these big kind of high stakes exams. <laughs> so it's it's a different system in many regards. But it was uh, I was a great experience to go. Do you find it preferable? Because to me, it sounds attractive to be able to just intensively study on something you're into. Um, well, to be honest, I kind of came away with mixed feelings. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm somebody who took a lot more history than I needed to right. to fulfill the requirements mm-hmm. of the major when I was in college. Um, but I still think students benefit from that, you know, the liberal arts ideal of mm-hmm. having to take a little bit of this, a little bit of that <laughs> here, you know, outside of your main area. But well, it's it's yeah. great preparation, especially if you go on to, to stay in that area. Then right. that's that intensive preparation is, is arguably If you're good. intending to become an academic. Mm-hmm. Because I was going to say that I would also you know play the devil's advocate and go with that other side of the coin that you just spoke about. Is a lot of times one of you know my personal pet peeves and maybe others is that academicians who have their own field and they they're so narrowly focused. Mm-hmm. There's not much out here that they even really know about that or even deal with because they're so focused either on their field or their subfield. They can talk to you about that, but it's such a narrow worldview. And uh, so, yeah, the well-rounded approach works as well. Yeah. <laughs> Who's best? We don't know. Yeah. But uh, f- then, why then, after three or four years there, I have 2003 to 2006, if that's about right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, what caused you to leave England since it was such a nice place? <laughs> um, well, we were happily living in London, um, but uh, our circumstances changed. My husband was working in finance, and the part of finance that was very hard hit by the, okay. <laughs> the crisis. Mm-hmm. So staying in, and I just decided to take a break um, okay. to, to basically start a family. Mm-hmm. So our children were born in London, so I was kind of home dealing with a mm-hmm. A couple month old baby and a you know, two year old, so I had my hands full, and um, so his situation changed as well. So we did. We just decided to take a chance. We were hope we when we were living in London, we found ourselves. London's lovely, but there's not a lot of sun to be honest. <laughs> it's got the reputation for rain. It doesn't actually rain that much, but it's awfully cloudy a okay. lot of the time. So we were kind of drawn towards uh, Southern Europe, especially Spain and France and Italy mm-hmm. for for lots of reasons. So we did. Um, we decided to buy a little piece of property there. We're expecting to retire there later on, much mm. later on, or at least have a vacation home. But we kind of, things changed in London, and we decided that we wanted to make a change and said, all right, let's 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 do something a little crazy. So we had this <laughs> piece of property in rural Spain and built, uh, it was an almond grove, cleared a little wow. some of the almond trees away, put a house there with wow. solar panels and a well, because it's totally off the grid. Yeah. And, um had had a wonderful time there as well. But it was too far from family. Oh. So we ended up coming back to the United States. So, to rule Spain <laughs> in Aragon. Yes. And I thought maybe you taught there because apparently the city itself has some beautiful churches, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Uh, well, we were actually living in a teeny weeny town, 250 people. Oh, wow. So we Even were, smaller. We were in the countryside <laughs> outside a very small town. So a wonderful town and really, really had a terrific experience. Our kids went to school there. The town was incredibly welcoming and... And were so. you just raising the kids at that point? Uh, you weren't doing anything ac- academic at that point? Not really. I did do some kind of distance work uh, with textbooks. Because mm-hmm. you were in publishing a little bit, I saw. So publishing for history or mm-hmm. Working on some history textbooks. Books, yeah. etc. cetera. Um, now, after, after Spain, um, actually, was this where this came in, the... Uh, the, the Gelder Lehrman Institute of American History. Ah, oh, actually, that's <laughs> looping back. Oh, that's back. What was <laughs> yes. earlier? I I worked there um, directly after finishing my PhD. So that oh, was okay. before I applied for the fellowship. Okay, Cambridge. that wasn't clear. But <laughs> we will cut yes. that out. But uh, then again, you talked about the book, which is, mm-hmm. as far as we know, at this point, the only book that you've published thus far. Uh, at least a solo author, Mm -hmm. and uh, why did you choose the topic of flight attendance for your dissertation and for your book? Well, uh, it was the luck of the archives, you might say. Um, (laughs) I was, it was, I think, my second year in graduate school. Um, One unlucky thing, New York uh, York University at the time required three years of coursework, so it took a little longer to do a PhD there than other places where you normally only do two years of coursework. But anyway, second second year I was in a uh, graduate seminar and looking for a labor history topic and NYU has a terrific um, library and archive within its larger library um, 
system called the Tamament Library and Robert um, Wagner Archives, and they specialize in labor and left history. So I was basically just in there poking around to see what interesting collections they had that I might write about. And they have the collections of a group called Stewardesses for Women's Rights, ah. which was an activist group uh, from about 1972 to 1977. And not a large group, mm -hmm. but a very vociferous group that really went out and tried to make a lot of feminist noise, mm -hmm. so to speak, about very much saw themselves as part of the feminist movement and were trying to draw attention to um, a lot of issues around flight attendant employment. Mm -hmm. So I just, you know, not knowing anything about them, really, I mean, there's all these glamorous stereotypes. So the idea right. of feminist stewardesses sounded really <laughs> intriguing. So that got me hooked on the topic and that developed into my dissertation, which eventually became the book. The book. All right. Now, I know usually, I think the rule, I guess, is when you write a dissertation. You're supposed to write on a topic that, or type under a topic of something that's never been done before. Now, did you find much previous written on flight attendants from the angle that you took? Um, there, was, there was already work out there. I think, especially if you're doing something like American history, where we've got a, you know, if, if you talk to a European historian, for example, they'll say, "Oh, that's only a couple centuries. You know, that's not that much history." <laughs> that's nothing. That's not right. history. Right. So it's you know, it's a relatively small span of time in the global framework, and a lot of people doing American history here. So there's very mm -hmm. few topics that nobody's written about at all anymore. Mm -hmm. So usually it's coming in and doing something new with the topic, mm -hmm. instead of doing something completely uncharted. Right. Um, but in my case, there there were a few things. There was a, a wonderful book. Um, where I really did cover a fair amount of the same territory. Uh, a retired flight attendant herself, actually I'm not sure she was retired at the time, but anyway, um, a woman who had worked for quite a while as a flight attendant and a mm -hmm. union official mm -hmm. went and did a graduate degree and wrote a wonderful history mm -hmm. of the flight attendant unions. So, so not that, Dusty Rhodes? No, <laughs> no, uh, Georgia uh, Panter Nielsen okay. wrote a wonderful book uh, that came out quite a bit before mine, so that was already there. Um, there's a wonderful sociological book called The Managed Heart, which mm. wasn't really meant to be a history of flight attendants, but it's by a sociologist who was interested in emotions. What, is, what does it mean when you have to present a certain kind of emotion as part of your work? Mm -hmm. So she wrote this book looking at bill collectors and flight attendants. Okay. You're kind of the two ends of the mm -hmm. spectrum of jobs where you're dealing with difficult emotions potentially, or having to, you know, for flight attendants, it's having to always seem cheery. Bill collectors, it's dealing with a pretty grim situation. Right. You know, how, how do those people make sense of that? So that was already out there as a very well-known academic work. And there were a few dissertations and things, but not a whole lot. So Now, your book, though, I mean, I was surprised when I went to go get it, and I still have it at home. It's actually still it's actually on the shelf at the Central Pratt Library. Oh, <laughs> good. So it's not like they got to call downstairs and find it. It was there. Because and and watching all the or looking at all the citations on Google, it seemed like people would think of you as you know the authority on the history of flight attendants because uh, it's the only book that's in and it doesn't seem like it's linked to anything you know that it's it's you're the authority and I don't know if people well, still come to you <laughs> for 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 your you know opinions on topics regarding flight attendants but uh, well I do occasionally still hear from a journalist or two but uh, actually um, some more works have come out since my book came out so it's a oh, okay. it's it's filling in the, oh, okay the, the area is you, filling you in with some other it, works uh, people taking different approaches and um, and various things so there's there's still plenty more to say about the topic so I think right. it's great that and, people are still working uh, you on it briefly touched on that so uh, I would say that let people know who haven't read it yet and maybe will read it what the book is about well, it's, um, it's, it's a history of flight attendants that looks, on the one hand, at their image, this idea that for a long time they were held up as kind of the ideal woman, somebody you'd very much like to marry, or um, you know, kind of perfect embodiment of what it meant to be a gracious hostess and attractive and well-groomed and all these very, you know, kind of an idealized version of femininity, but at right. the same time they were doing a job. And um, they also unionized in the late 1940s. They ended up being very important to the women's movement um, even before stewardesses for women's rights, mm -hmm. they're one of the first groups that really um, mm -hmm. pushes the federal government to, to say that the civil rights movement, which said that you can't discriminate on the basis of race as well as sex mm -hmm. and national origin and religion, to, to push the federal government to actually act on the part that dealt with women instead. Because the civil rights bill generally was really meant to address segregation and racial discrimination, mm -hmm. but this little part said oh, we're going to deal with sex discrimination too and they were one of the first groups literally to show up at the EEOC when it opened its doors to say mm, 
the airlines are firing us <laughs> when we get married or turn 32, and they don't do that to anybody else, and we don't think that's fair. So they were actually really crucial to, to the early years of uh, sex discrimination, um, getting the, the, the law implemented, really, and, and, and setting up these crucial uh, precedents. Because I think things that maybe a lot of people today are not aware of that struck me is that, you know, they had these different requirements. There was, as you just mentioned, ageism, weight requirements. Mm. You had to be single, unmarried. You better not get pregnant. All these things. And to me, one of their biggest battles, and I know from, from reading the book, was being accepted and getting licensed as basically safety professionals. And they worked long and hard for that, and it seemed like they got that one last. Yes. And because uh, they wanted to legitimize themselves as professionals. Mm -hmm. I'm not just a hostess. I'm not just a smile. I'm not just a glamour girl of the air. Yes, and, absolutely. And, uh, and that came across, you know, strongly in your book. And I thought one of the things interesting to me, it would be an interesting point, is that I think it said, or you, were, you stated in the book, or at least that's what I got from it, was it that was unique in that they used basically their image, they used femininity to be feminist, mm. to get what they wanted as, as far as their rights as workers, to say we can still be feminine, all this stuff, because like, you know, they go to, to Congress and a whole bunch, you know, it's like, do I look like an old bag, that kind of thing, <laughs> yes. you know, but still trying to make their point <laughs> that we do hard work. And especially, I know that was a big change in the way the delivered service, which you bring up in the book, with the advent of the jet age. Mm, yes, absolutely. More bigger planes, more passengers. Yeah, almost more of an assembly line approach to, to passenger right. service. The old style model was very much, you know, there's a couple flight attendants and maybe 40 passengers and, you know, they bring every tray out from the galley individually and have a lot more contact with people. And then you get into the service card and the jumbo jet and it's a, it's a different... They, they're still holding on to the the airlines are still holding on to the glamour image of flight attendants at that point, but the right. work is definitely changing. Right, because I mean that was an important thing that you mentioned about the labor movement is you know a big change for them was was the Title Seven, hmm. which Absolutely. you mentioned, which at the last minute they stuck in sex discrimination. Yes, as I remember, and yes. and uh, that was hugely important for flight attendants. And then of course it changes again post nine eleven. Yes. Well, um, there's a few kind of big turning points, and Title VII is a, the introduction of the jets is a big turning point. Title VII is a turning point. Um, deregulation in 1978 right, is a big right, turning right, point, right, right. but 9-11 but is a, a huge turning point as well. And, you know, I think people maybe don't remember as much that, you know, flight attendants themselves were among the, those who were killed in the attacks, and mm -hmm. um, it just changed the whole calculus of what does it mean to be secure on a flight. And, um, you know, economically for the industry, too, there's a, a big shakeout afterwards, and a lot of people lose their jobs, um, and you get into another big cost-cutting era, and that's always hard on the mm -hmm. workers who work in that industry, of course. A little bit like deregulation, but mm -hmm. with this horrible, you know, threat of, of terrorism. Right. Now, do you see, in bringing things to the present day, do you still see in-flight attendants uh, echoes of past discrimination or are things better now for flight attendants than they were let's say 20 so years ago which is basically where you end your book well I think things have certainly moved on there's a bit of a residue you might say of the the old appearance requirements I mean airlines are very sensitive about how service workers look and they still worry a little bit more about the flight attendants than they do other other work groups I think mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly not like it used to be I mean you don't have to Flight attendants for a long time pushed for the standard of physical fitness. That should be the mm -hmm. judge of our, mm -hmm. our, our how our bodies look for this job. It shouldn't mm -hmm. be that I have to meet this incredibly strict weight standard. And eventually, that really has become the predominant standard. Mm -hmm. That um, as long as you can, you know, physically evacuate the plane in however many seconds, you know, that's fine. We're not going to worry about your weight right. otherwise. So things have definitely gotten more progressive in that sense. But you know, as you were saying, that you know, economically, the job in some ways has gotten tougher. And right, right. Um, some of the perks that were there are no longer there. People are crankier, <laughs> I think. I mean, that's just been a long-term progression that passengers, you know, a lot of people talk about the golden age of flying. And, yes. you know, there was an era where the food was good and people wore, you know, ties and hats and gloves there was to food. fly. A lot of times there's no yeah. food on short flights. But, right. Uh, so, I mean, there's been a kind of slow transformation to a mass. It's now very much mass transit. Now, something that you did obviously mention in your book because you're obviously focused on American flight attendants mm -hmm. is my you know, thoughts, and I don't fly that often, but to notice 
that I still think when I see it like in the in the terminals and things like this, more of that traditional view or actually appearance of a of an old stewardess in European flight attendants than there is in American. It seems like there's still a little bit more of that the way if you go in Lufthansa or someplace else, you, see, they're, you know, they're still looking very <laughs> feminine and uh, I don't know that you do much international traveling, but it just seems that they maybe are, have a different approach because, you know, they maybe not go through the, the labor issues that we did except for British Airways, but. Uh, well, I think, um yeah, the European airlines, I think, have tracked somewhat with the U.S. in terms of the liberalization of they requirements have, okay. and, and whatnot. Um, usually people point to Asian airlines or Middle Eastern mm-hmm. airlines to see a kind of a bit of a throwback Still to, a, more to that, yeah. a little bit more focus on the appearance and, and mm-hmm. um, youth, mm-hmm. a kind of youthful glamour, youthful feminine glamour. It seems a little more salient in, in those markets than it is. Um, and, you know, not coincidentally, those aren't. Uh, feminism hasn't paid, played out quite <laughs> the same way in right, those areas exactly. that it has here. Right. Um, so the European case, it may be, it may have to do with short haul versus long haul. I mean, um, mm-hmm. the it's it's traditionally been a job that runs on seniority, and mm-hmm. as you move up the ladder, typically people go to international routes because those mm-hmm. are. I mean, in Europe, it's a different scenario from the U.S. Anyway, where there's right. a lot more there's a lot more focus on domestic travel because we're yes. much larger right. geographically, but. Um, so it may be that there's more um, a different set of people and a different set of requirements that plays out to give you that impression at, on the long haul versus yeah. a more casual approach in the yeah, U.S. Right, maybe right. for right. domestic travel. And there's a little right. more of the formality still. You know, mm-hmm. living in Europe, we traveled quite a bit back and forth. And mm-hmm. generally, um, international travel feels a bit more like <laughs> <laughs> the, this the service standards seem a bit more like you would have had 10 20 years ago on domestic mm-hmm. flights now and because mm-hmm. it's you know here we've gotten to this just kind of you know very minimal food service very minimal yes, kind right. of service mm-hmm. on shorter domestic flights whereas the international flights you still get free wine and <laughs> you still get a meal for free and you know it's a right. bit a bit more traditional in that way so well, maybe I mean, that carries over into the yes I was appearance saying, requirements and whatnot. yes i was gonna say in europe it's uh different too and I think geographically because of the countries so many different countries in small space that were 60 years ago with the advent of jets overtook railroads as a passenger mover in this country where there's still a lot of railroading going mm-hmm. on in Europe and in Asia you know so yeah. that's a change mm-hmm. and of course saying that you're an expert you were also the historical advisor on a documentary film called Fly With Me yes that was <laughs> lots of fun <laughs> was that yeah, based was, on your book, or what was it? Actually? Um, not specifically. I think they they use my book among other sources. It was it was meant to be kind of general history of flight attendants in in the right. U.S. and that was lots of fun. Okay, um, and I'm trying to think of where else I'm going with this, um, which is okay. Bringing us up to the present. Are there any other books in you, or <laughs> <laughs> anything else you want to write about, or? <laughs> um, Nothing, nothing urgent at the moment. I, then if I had um, stayed in an academic position with more of a focus on research, uh, the second book I wanted to, to look into doing would have been a history of Hollywood, women in Hollywood specifically, oh. and c- uh, carrying through an idea from the flight attendant book that I mm-hmm. tried to argue in that book. Um, being glamorous, if it's part of your job, is actually a form of work. You have to work hard to look glamorous. Mm-hmm. And the airline certainly required that of flight attendants. But you know, this idea that they're ideal women also says that's not really work, then you're just being an ideal woman. So I think that's part of what flight attendants were after, some respect for the fact that mm-hmm. they met these very exacting standards and it's that is work. Those are skills, even though they may not look like what you right. think of as work and skills. So I was thinking of kind of taking that and maybe looking at the work that act- actresses do in front of the camera what work goes into producing glamour behind the camera, you know, right. makeup artists and, you know, how Hollywood produces glamour and all the women's work right. that goes into that and what that means. Especially um, during the golden era in yes. Hollywood. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas some of the things we're talking about, the sexism goes on today because it's very current in the news about Harvey Weinstein. Yes. So that kind of casting couch kind of idea is still out there. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's an industry that trades in femininity, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of what they do. It's not everything they do, certainly, but it's certainly part of it. Right. Now, have you been published in like other books or written articles for magazines and journals and such? Um, some academic journals. Oh, you have? Yes. And I, <laughs> I wrote a little tiny book in Spanish, which was quite a struggle because I, <laughs> I, I learned Spanish only by living there and I <laughs> uh-huh. never really got fluent. But with a lot of help from friends, wrote a little book in Spanish uh, when we were living in Spain. 
uh, on the history of almond growing in the area. <laughs> so I have a, okay. a, a strange pastiche of other uh, publications. <laughs> now going back to the Historical Society, mm -hmm. what made you decide, hey, I'm going to take that job? Well, um, working for the Gilder Lehrman Institute, as I did for a little while between graduate school and, and going off to, to England for the Cambridge Fellowship, um, I really liked working in public history. Because as much as I loved academia, there is, uh, as you were saying before, you know, the academics tend to focus on talking to each other mm -hmm. and not talking to other people mm -hmm. who are interested in history but don't necessarily dig in quite the way that academics do. So I, I love that part of public history, and that's very much what we do at the Historical Society. We're there to, mm -hmm. to produce um, high-quality history, but not for a narrow audience. We're trying to make history... Um, engaging for for everybody who has some inkling that they're interested in what happened in this county mm -hmm. you know we want to try and stoke that interest and support it and provide research materials provide interesting things to read provide interesting programs all of that so I I very much um, enjoy that mission mm -hmm. do you miss teaching I do miss student contact a little bit it's uh, it can be frustrating, <laughs> certainly, <laughs> but um, but no, I do. Students can be wonderful to work with, and again, you know, judging History Day is like the, yeah. the best possible student <laughs> contact. That's why I love it so much. Of course, uh, because my first impression, when I say, like reading, let's say your vitae or whatever you want to say, is say, look, okay, here's this graduate. I mean, first of all, graduate from Harvard, magna cum laude, goes. It's the PhD, NYU, okay? Not a lot of people know if that's a big history school or not. And then, wow, Cambridge. And I said, why isn't she a tenured professor somewhere? <laughs> you know, like, you know, or head of a department by now, that kind of thing. But you just said, I think, in some ways, that's one of the reasons you didn't go that way, because you like public yes. history. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, everybody has their own complicated journey, and <laughs> academia is tough. I mean, there's um, not that many people get PhDs, but there's plenty more of them than there are tenure-track professorships, so <laughs> a lot of us need to find something else to do, too. So. Oh, I can understand that. Which is uh, a good thing, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or it can be a good thing. You'd have, yeah. have something else, um, because, uh, you know, it, I know it's, it's rough out there, because like, so my daughter has her master's degree in anthropology and cannot get a paid position in the field, mm. so yeah. it's tough. It's tough, and it's just getting tougher all the time, really. And that, so. it's hard, and also, like, there's never enough funding for, for projects, because she did do archaeology as well in graduate school, and just there's never any real funding to complete an archaeological project. You do a, yeah. a, a dig for like two or three weeks, they make you stop, or you run out of money, or you know, and you need years probably on, if it's a really rich site. So, you know, I can understand that. So, the last thing I guess would be say, is there anything that you would like to add? Well, I would like to mention our big fundraiser coming up for okay. the Historical Society, which should be lots <laughs> of fun. We're doing it this year at the Fire Museum of Maryland. Mm -hmm. It's December 2nd from 7 to 10 p.m. And basically you get to come into the Fire Museum, see all of their exhibits, mm -hmm. and they'll have their uh, holiday train garden out, and there'll okay. be um, refreshments for everybody. We'll have beer and wine and hors d'oeuvres and desserts. Mm -hmm. And so you can come out and see lots of other people who care about history, enjoy the Fire Museum, and support us and all that we do to, to make sure that, you know, and they we get preserve tickets, that local history and tickets through your uh, through our website. So the website and the website yes. is tell us give us that contact information. Yes, thank you. The <laughs> website is www.hsobc.org. So it's just our, our initials, Historical Society of Baltimore County. Uh, we ha always have lots of information on Facebook about our events. So we're at Baltimore County History on Facebook. You can find us there. We tweet as well. We do a little <laughs> bit of Instagram and LinkedIn, but mostly most of our information is, um, or Facebook is the best source for information on what we're up to and the website. Okay. And is, what about your own contact information. How could people reach you? Uh, well, to reach me personally, just contact the Historical Society and ask for me. Uh, okay. Our phone number is 410-666-1878. Um, you can email us at info at hsobc.org. And uh, mm -hmm. it's as easy as that. <laughs> okay, very good. Sounds very simple. Well, I wanted to thank you for giving us some of your Sunday afternoon today. Oh, my it, was, pleasure. It, was, it was a pleasure for me. Thank and, you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Well, you're very, very welcome. I was thrilled to have you. And well, folks, guess what? We got through another show here on the Paul Stefan Show, and uh, we'll be seeing you next time. Bye-bye. You're watching the Paul Stefan Show on TV Free Baltimore.